I have spoken over my 30-year career at probably well over 100 conferences, some 50, 100 times the size of this one. And I'll tell you, just in the last few hours, the power of being in a room where nothing is being sold is amazing. <laughs> And creating a space like this is truly a holy act. It's truly a holy space. And uh, it's a temporary space, so I hope you all feel the power, just from my perspective. Um, it's already my favorite conference, so. Uh, so uh, I'm often called the AI guy, or at least I was at my previous company. So you might expect from an AI guy a talk all about AI. I will have a few slides on that because part of the goal should be you know, education in terms of what do you need to know about AI and nothing more than, than what you really need to know. We, we don't need to go into deep dive tech. And I am someone who loves technology and spent a whole career getting into it. But today I hope to give you a larger social context of how I and many people I talked with believe AI can enable greater connection uh, locally and globally uh, support regeneration of leadership, organizations, and our local economy, economy. And I will explain how I believe AI requires all of us, in fact, to become better humans. It will give us that opportunity. And my hope is that as you dig in over the next two days, learn more about the practice of AI, I think there was some practice this morning um, that I was unable to attend, that you can make these connections to our larger culture and society as other speakers have already done so beautifully and integrate it into your vision of, of yourself because some of you here are creators and individuals you know, who might work on your own businesses or con contract yourself services and some of you here are part of or lead organizations. So I think um, it goes for both the individual and for the organization. Okay, so you got to do two different things at one time here. Okay, so before I do that, let me go back to 1989. Um, an 18-year-old pre-law freshman at university, and I'm required to take a sociology class. And I stumble upon a class that only asks for the whole semester a written autobiography. And I hear that attendance is not even required. It's not taken, not required. Easy, right? The class is uh, taught by Dr. Erwin Powell of Blessed Memory, a character straight out of a different era. This is 1989. He is part beatnik, part hippie, wild graying hair, and he's riding his bike around campus, even in the wintertime and in the snow. Never had a car. Um, and he has a kind of a smile that both presents kind of wisdom, but also mischief. And we gather in the rare books room of the main library in kind of a round amphitheater, about 30 people. And you have the kind of warm glow of the uh, reading lamps. And that kind of, in the air, is that musty smell of old books and uh, leather bindings. And we're all sitting in these wooden chairs that are constantly making noise. And Dr. Powell's lectures are a stream of consciousness that only someone of a lifetime of education, of self-education, as we heard about today, how important self-education is, a consciousness of philosophy, theology, politics, literature, sociology, a, a poetry, all about sort of how one finds himself um, and, and the origins of self-knowledge and self-realization. Sort of um, things that we kind of take for granted in, in, in now, this is still the Reagan-Bush era. This was not the tenor of the time. And for the 18-year-olds in the room, you know, we were on a career track, not on a self-exploration track. Um, and what I want to talk about is just why I'm telling you the story. It's not just a story of self-discovery. We all went through our teens and 20s. We all have that story. Um, it's really a story about what happens when 30 strangers get together in a dimly uh, uh, lit room and each take time to tell their personal stories. The atmosphere shifts. I watch these classmates, you know, and it's like a breakfast club story. If anyone knows the movie, there's some jocks, there's some real nerdy academics, there's some sociology majors, law majors, there's kind of the, the, um, the wallflowers. And people start telling their autobiographies that they worked with on the whole semester. And some people are crying. Some people just have a shaky voice. Some people who kind of hunched over for the entire semester are standing straight for the first time as they find their power and their voice. 
And, you know, we, we realize that, you know, I realize that, and I'm sure others did as well, that two things are true. That like here today, we're all here supposedly to learn about AI. Everyone was there to, to go to university. But the individual stories, the thousands of choices, the, the motivation, the sense of purpose, the goals of why each person follows a path in their life and ends up in the same room are completely unique and different. Each is a universe unto itself. But it's also true when you learn to move away from binary thinking, when two things can be true at one time, that those different stories are exactly what unite us, right? Because we could all see ourselves in these different journeys and empathize and put ourselves in someone else's place and say, well, what would I have done if I came from that background, that experience? So this experience led me uh, on a path for my entire career to, con to understand um, complex technical ecosystems and how they interact with people. Um, for the next 27 years, I, I earned the nickname at my company of Cowboy because I was the individual they sent in to understand an emerging technology that really no one else in the company understood except for a handful of engineers. Uh, whether it was um, Bluetooth, fiber optics, Wi-Fi, cloud computing, and eventually AI, things we all kind of take for granted now, um, you know, I was the one who went in to try to understand them. Um, my secret was I was always trying to understand the why of the customer, the why of the market, the why of the technology itself. Uh, we take that grant for granted now. We didn't have the language of the why, how, why back then, but that's how I approached things. Um, to the customers, I appeared to be an engineer. To engineers, I appeared to be kind of a liberal arts, business, humanist nature person. Uh, but in reality, reality, I was just a freshman back in college, seeking to understand the stories behind the faces. And that brings me here to you today, because I'm talk talking to you about AI, which paradoxically has the ability to transform and make us better humans. Just as in sociology class taught me to look beyond the surface of the self, AI challenges to re-examine what it means to be human in a world of intelligent machines. As we embark on this discussion, and I think this has really actually been the tenor of the whole day so far, I invite you to think back to your own formative experiences. In fact, I think we've had at least two exercises on this. What shaped your understanding of, your understanding of humanity, and how might that guide you in the era of artificial intelligence? I'm 52. The era of artificial intelligence that will truly take over this world will happen when I'm 70 and it's not my problem anymore. And really, what's really the job of everyone in this room, no matter what your background, is how do we collectively handle the unintended consequences of AI? It will happen, just like social media happened. And as a society, we're all dealing with the unintended consequences of social media. And whether you're an AI person or not, whether you care about AI or not, we're all gonna deal with the unintended consequences. So we have no choice but to kind of dive in. Sorry, I'm not used to doing two screens at one time. Um, one second here. All oh, right, we go this way. Yeah, that was my screenshot of my, my ID, so I'll move on from there. Okay, so where should we start on this conversation? Yeah, I'm off again. Okay, where should we start on this conversation of AI? Maybe we should start with what is human? And not like what's human intelligence, because that's such an academic kind of wonky conversation. Um, but what really makes us human? AI obviously raises these really complex abstract ideas. Um, I believe that as AI develops, it will invariably give us clarity about these questions. Let's start with this picture, this picture that I took of my son. I'm a photographer, an amateur photographer. And I thought taking a picture, or showing a picture here would be really helpful because this is one of the areas where AI is supposed to be so amazing, right? I look at AI-generated photographs and I am bored. They're vapid. They're obviously AI-created. It's amazing that, that a computer system is doing that. But those photographs are just pixels on the screen and they have no meaning. I have a love of photography. I have a love of film. This is my son. We're going to Sundance in Utah and going to a park in the winter, Archers National Park. And there he is standing with a camera. I could cry talk, talking about this picture, by the way. I've done it before. Um, and he's in film school. So we're going to Sundance to watch film, taking photos in a park. This is past, present, future context 
memory, and most importantly, the choice of a father and son to go on a trip together. For anyone with young children, this is the definition of successful parenthood, when, you're, when, you're, when your children go on a trip with you. Um, so, you know, so AI, actually, in the past, I would have said, this is a beautiful picture. Look at the pixels. Now I realize the pixels are not what's beautiful about this photograph. It's everything that's in the context and memory of this photograph. So my belief is that um, we do not choose to do meaningful things. Things are meaningful because we choose to do them, which is why we all have these individual paths. So I'll say that again. We do not choose to do meaningful things. Things are meaningful because we choose to do them. So how do we bring this back in the context of why we're all here today? Probably loosely for almost everybody here associated with work, employment, career. Maybe some people are just here out of just pure general interest. Um, but also work has that context of meaning. People come together to solve complex problems. Profit, nonprofit, environment, doesn't really matter. But the meaning of the work comes from the choice of individual people to come together and do that work. Okay? So let's talk about how AI might be able to augment the human capabilities to do that work. So the three messages today I want to leave you with is AI is a tool to augment, not mimic people. It can be used to mimic people. It can be used to lay off people. I think that would be um, not only a stupid, but it wouldn't even realize the full value of AI. AI start, adoption starts with the goal. This is the number one thing I talk to my clients about. They want to bring me in and help them do AI. And I say, we're not going to do AI. Let's figure out what your goals are, what your problems are, what your opportunities are. And especially when people bring up problems all the time, but a great question to ask anyone is, why does this problem exist before we start trying to solve it? And AI compels us to be better human beings. So here are my two AI technology slides. But I do think it's important for, again, everyone to understand some aspect of AI. So at the very top is just what we call today classical machine learning, just analytics. Almost every company in the world does some form of analytics. Uh, if you have a database and you run you know, algorithms on it, you're doing analytics. And the most important thing to know about this fancy picture, actually it's a very simplified picture, is that there was a split between describing what it is that you were looking for in the data called feature extraction and then building a model. It's a very time-consuming prescriptive act. It's some, a simple example might be describe a person and I prescriptively program that into my model. The amazing thing about deep learning um, is that we've combined these two stages into something where you can just feed labeled data, it could be any data, and the model actually learns how to identify what's in the data. And then you feed it, you know, then you create an actual production model, and they're just, you know, this is what ChatGPT is doing, this is what image recognition systems are doing. So you feed a model hundreds of pictures of animals, you label those pictures, and you never describe the animal, you never describe the dog. The model actually learns. And you can imagine how powerful this is for two reasons. One, because there's more data in the world than we know what to do with, right? There's more data in the world than we can process. Um, two, there's lots of data, what we call unstructured data, pictures, language, video, things that don't sit, fit into neat columns and rows like an Excel spreadsheet that is very, very hard to process. It's actually most of the data that exists in the world. And in fact, over the last 20 years, we have 70x more digital data than we did 20 years ago. And the other thing that's happened is the cost of compute has fallen 1,000x. Now, that has some consequences for the environment in terms of power utilization. But you combine cheap compute, huge amounts of unstructured data, and you get this incredibly powerful technology. Uh, what are the top use cases right now for deep learning? I think some of these have already been addressed. It's really like this co-pilot idea, right, this assistant idea. You know, customer support, writing marketing documents, code writing. It's not yet able to run operations, right? A lot of our business, a lot of our organizations, a lot of our nonprofits are operations. AI can't run operations yet. Um, in terms of what is artificial intelligence, I actually don't spend a lot of time talking about that. I think that's also a boring topic. It's philosophical. But I love this quote from Larry Tesler, which is, artificial intelligence is simply whatever is not understood yet. 
And once we understand it, we take it for granted and we don't call it artificial intelligence anymore. Um, the last thing, and this is one of my themes I, I write a lot about, is this kind of an AI fallacy. That since models or model algorithms work, we know they work, if you go to chat GPT, you see these things work, that models themselves have value. And that is false. So I live in an environment of sort of tech optimism and some of that tech broism, and everyone's always talking about their models, their models, what their models can do. Models have no value, right? So um, we'll talk more about wh where the value comes from, but it doesn't come from the technology. Okay, so I want to address another point, which is what has actually happened over the last two to three years since ChatGPT was released in November of 22? And it's important because there's this general perception that somehow AI is controlled by few. Absolutely false, okay? I have never seen a technology go from development to open sourcing, which for those of you who are not in the industry, just means the code or parts of the code or the algorithms are given away, posted online, and can be downloaded by anybody with different kinds of licenses. I have never seen a technology go from you know, appearance to widespread availability as fast as AI. So if we think about something like ChatGPT, it is trained on the world's data, which is why it's a great general answer system, question answer system. And it is trained in data center scale environments. Thousands, tens of thousands of computers are training on all the world's data. When I say all the world's data, obviously I mean all the data on the web, all the data that's digitized, and so on. And then, for various reasons, different companies open sourced it, which just means they, they let out their own models to the world. And what's quickly happened is, and I won't go through all the technical details, but something like GPT extra large, that's what Excel stands for, is hundreds of billions, if not a trillion parameters. And what people have done in, in the net last three years is shrunken the size of those models a thousand X. So while you do hear all the environmental impact of these incredibly large models, the fact is that most of the models in the world will be incredibly small and run on your phone and laptop. Right? And they already are running on a lot of phones and laptops. So I just wanted to make a point that we should not be fearing AI in terms of only a few people controlling it, because actually it's out there. You can download a model right now to do anything that you want, right? And you need to know how to use it and how to integrate it, but it is not controlled by a few. These really large models that are basically Q&A models, yeah, those are owned by only a few, but that makes sense. I mean, why would you have 50 or 100 of those in the world? We probably already have too many. Um, so the, the last thing, so that's my, oh, I'm gonna talk about AI. If you understood all that, that's great. I think that's probably much what, all, what anyone who's not an AI expert really needs to understand. The last thing I wanna say is I think this is another sort of bad behavior by the tech industry that I'm part of, is some confusion about where does AI come from if you are a user of AI, you're a company, you wanna buy it, rent it, in, 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 uh, implement it in your company. Do you go to an AI company? What is an AI company? Now every company in the tech world, at least, even in the non-tech world, are rebranding themselves as AI companies. So where do I get AI from? Well, what we see in technology is that technology eventually becomes a feature. I was in, in the early days of Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi used to be a technology. It barely worked. It was barely interoperative. You used to have to reboot your laptop just to get the Wi-Fi to work when you plugged in an external, external card. That was a technology. Now Wi-Fi is a feature that's the 20th bullet on a box of a product that you buy. Right? So AI, to some extent, is already heading in that direction. But I do want to, if any of you are in the, you know, sort of talking to vendors, trying to figure out what to do, I think this is a pretty good model to think about. That something like ChatGPT, right, knows about business. You can ask it all kinds of business questions, right? Um, but doesn't really know anything about your business, right? Because your business is based on your proprietary data, your mission, your values, and so on, or your nonprofit or your organization. Um, then there'll be like software companies, like the oracles of the world, that knows about your industry, right? Um, you know, there's companies that in farming and agriculture products, and they're gonna start using AI, banking, and they're gonna know about your industry. And so um, they can, you can help shape the models uh, to be purposely built for your company. And really, there's the models that know about your business. 
And this is where people you're going to go from um, make to buy, right? So the left side's really kind of the buy side. The right side's kind of the, the make side. And if you're a large enough organization or even just a, a dynamic user, you'll probably end up doing some things on the left and maybe you'll do something on the right, right? And I think there's a lot of value here, but you know, lots of users over there. So this is the way to think about where AI is proliferating and, and how to get it. So now that I've talked about AI, one thing that comes up a lot is that 50 to 80% of all AI projects fail to get to production. 50 to 80% consistently in, in um, you know, study after study that's produced, uh, that's been uh, done and then publicly shared. 50 to 80%. Certainly underwhelming when we're hearing about AI might either destroy the world or save the world. Most people have trouble even getting AI into production. Okay? These are some of the reasons that especially technical people will give around why AI doesn't get to production successfully, and these are not really the real reasons. Right? This is um, not my experience and my experience of my peers who I network with when we talk to um, customers. Um, the real reasons why AI fails is resistance to change, lack of an AI vision, Silos, in larger organizations, people don't communicate across organizations. People are just not educated enough on AI. People say, do AI, my worst, the worst phrase in my business is just do AI, but there's no return on investment of doing AI, right? And a common thing I tell people, if they wanna go do a proof of concept in AI, I say, you wanna see a proof of concept of AI? Log in the chat GPT, it's the world, it's history's biggest POC ever, right? I mean, they're spending billions of dollars. They're not profitable. It's a, product, it's a proof of concept. That's what POC stands for. So you don't need to do an R, an R, uh, a proof of concept to see if AI works. You need to really stop, think, you know, and address some of these questions. And there's no process to measure the value of what you're doing. So what are the real challenges? Why most AI fails? Didn't deliver business outcomes. Not, not prepared to incorporate it into business decisions. We're hearing AI is supposed to automate business or operations. I've been at companies where they say we're doing AI, and I say, have you changed your decision-making process at all? They go, no, it's just another input into how we run our business. So you've spent money on AI, you have human inputs, and now you have a computer input, and you've not changed your business. So you've not made money, you've not made an ROI, you've just spent money, right? Now, also, you shouldn't be giving up power to computers so fast. But that's part of the issue is no one thinks about how we're going to change humans to adopt around the AI systems. And then no plan to scale, but I'll skip that, right? So we, we learned that we must kind of close the gap between people and technology. You know, the, va the value of AI comes from launching it in a, w in a way that enacts organizational change and activity that improves operations. By the way, this can go down to your, to your individual self if you're working for yourself. Right? If you're going to use AI, you should be stopping and thinking, how would I change my tasks? How would I change my day if I'm going to be using AI? Because why am I learning it, investing in it, adopting it, and then still doing things the way I was? So I, even though I might be talking a little bit in business language, I think this comes right down to the individual as well. Um, a model, as I said, is useless if it doesn't solve a problem. And a model cannot launch itself into production. It can, only be, it can be disruptive. Um, but only if you disrupt with it, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that now. It's a little loosey-goosey, which I love. This is great. Um, so it's a great quote here. Technology is not destiny. We shape our destiny. So AI can impact every part of an organization and address our world's most complex problems and challenges. Um, and it is unlike traditional IT, it is something that can be used by everybody, right? We don't really have anything in information technology that truly, I mean, yeah, we have devices like phones and laptops, but in terms of what IT usually does and adopts, adapts into their system, you know, usually you're just a user of it, I mean, or a consumer of it, but here everyone's gonna be a user of machine learning. But machine learning can only impact operations if you change operations around it. So it, the success in AI is actually rooted in organizational and human values, such as leadership, empowerment, and people. So let me put this in sort of an historical context um, about where most organizations are today that I work with and where they should be getting to. 
So planning. Everyone plans. You plan for yourself. You plan for your nonprofit. You plan for your, your, your for-profit business. And what is planning? Planning is analysis of the known with the assumption that whatever is, is will continue to be because you're looking at your data and your data is always backward looking. And I heard so many speakers today talk about hope and change and transformation. You don't get transformation when you just plan looking at your data by definition, right? But it's also a really comfortable place to be. You need to plan. Who am I going to hire? Uh, how much supply am I going to order? Am I going to build a warehouse? Everyone needs to plan. But it's also a place where it's really comfortable. This is a known entity. And guess who's the main customer of planning? It's you. I'm going to build a factory. I'm going to hire two people. I did it. It doesn't actually say your business is successful, but you've been able to achieve the goals you've set. And then we have something called strategy, right? And strategy, and by the way, planning is almost always called strategy or strategic planning, right? And so, but that's not true. But when people, nine out of 10 times when I'm in a meeting, people are saying, here's my strategy, it's just a plan, right? Um, strategy imagines a desirable future and makes a set of choices to bring it about. It's a theory of action. It's a theory about the future. It's a theory of what has to be true for you to be successful, right? The previous speaker is living that right now. I mean, she has a theory that you know, if you pay people, incentivize people, show dashboards, that you can incentivize people to, make, to uh, enact climate change in, in the local community. Um, that's not a plan. That's a strategy. That may or may not work, which is why it's so great that they're doing it. So wh why, why am I going through this? Is this like a business school education? Um, the reason why I'm going through this is because we're all stuck here. We're all stuck here. No one's doing as much strategy as they want. And if we are talking about um, um, closing the gap um, in our communities, in economic wealth, um, trying to improve the environment, then we need people to be better AI leaders. We need vision, uh, vision focusing on challenges and opportunities like we heard from the previous speaker. We need transformation in the world. And the transformation in the world comes if we can spend more time on strategy. What does this have to do with AI? This AI, for the first time, will give us an amazing opportunity to automate much of what's on your left, right? So this is why I say AI gives us the opportunity to be better humans. Because looking at spreadsheets all day long does not make you a better human being. <laughs> it's also not what human beings are good at. What, what is the human qualities needed in strategy? Possibility thinking, creativity, connectivity, imagination, you know, cooperation within your company, brainstorming, cooperation with your partners, your suppliers, your customers, maybe even your competitors. Talk about environmental change. No environmental change happens if competitors don't get together and talk about how we're going to you know, help the environment, right? You know, one company can't do it alone. So why I say AI can make us better humans is because I think AI is going to do a great job over here and free up 10 hours, 20 hours a week of our time. Also why I don't think AI should really be about laying people off. Because what I want to see, and what I talk to my clients about, is how are you going to repurpose the people to focus here, right? Let's not, let's not make money, let's innovate. Let's not save money, excuse me. Let's innovate. And I believe this is where the sort of the paradoxical aspect of what I'm talking about in AI is AI is not our savior. We're our savior. I think that was probably the point made pretty clearly before, uh, two speakers ago. Um, so we're our saviors, but you know, we're a little busy. So how do we get some free time to go save our world uh, or at least make improvement in our, in our world? Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, what, comes, what else comes along with the automation of tasks and greater insight in the data that we have. Uh, as I talk to clients, this is something that, oh, sorry about that. Um, this is something that comes up quite a lot, is that organizations are not binary. They don't really have just one kind of decision to make. It's simply not, I want to make better decisions that my clients want to, to have AI help them do. In working with clients, everyone has some version of a three-legged stool. It always seems to be three. And it's always some, some leg of 
I'm making, producing, providing something. That's my production, right? I have a supply of that, whether it's staff, whether it's actual products in a warehouse, whether it's things I'm growing. And then I have sort of some sort of service and flexibility. And, and this is the most exciting thing for me around um, how AI can help is really around scenario planning, right? What if in time, through the year, through economic cycles, through environmental disruptions, through political disruptions in the world in terms of, say, world trade as we've seen, what if I can constantly balance these three and prioritize one over the other? Usually you fix two and you change, you fix two and you change one. You know, what if in one year I want to have maximum service and flexibility? Well, I need to increase my supply and I can smooth my production out over the year. Or what if I want to keep my supply low? Well, I need to have spikes in my production because I'm going to react more real time and my service is going to go down. Um, in terms of um, what I'm seeing with some clients, because I was asked to give some real world examples, I'm working with a nonprofit on foster care. And the leader of this nonprofit had a brilliant idea. Foster care, 50 states. Uh, I'll just I'll give this one example, then I'll end on the next slide. Um, foster care of 50 states failed. They said, if we can sell 80, 89 different kinds of toothpaste to people, why can't we sell people to be foster parents? Use the same underlying technology to hyper-target parents that are culturally and geographically appropriate for the child or siblings that have to be placed. Go into the community, find you know, the like, like ethnic group of that person, and find the people that are most likely to foster that child. And they've had amazing success. The bar was incredibly low. So <laughs> I'm helping them get to the next bar. But this is what they've done on their own already. And there's other examples of that. So I'll leave you with this last slide. I'm assuming we're distributing the slides. I was in Maine last week. I saw this slide because the way life should be needs to connect with the way life is. And this is the opposite of utopianism. Utopianism says we need to destroy the way things are and create a whole new world. And this says, no, if you want to plan the future, make sure it's rooted in the present. And I will not read this, but I, it's the most words I've had in this slide, so I think this is a great leave behind, was empowering people in the age of AI. AI is not the goal. It's a catalyst to transform your organization. In fact, um, I don't even think, I don't even care about AI. I think AI is actually, because it's such a hype right now, is actually a great excuse to get back to what all of you envisioned for yourself or for your organization when you first started whatever your endeavor is. You all had your dream and your vision, and then you got busy, and you're paying bills, and you're trying, trying to get your accounts receivable in order, and what happened to the dream of the business or the personal pursuit you're on? AI is now actually an excuse to think back to getting back, not going forward so much, but getting back to the roots of where you wanted to be and think about um, these different things, which I will not read because I am out of time, but I am also done. Thank you. Thank you.